Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we continue to discuss important aspects of financial wellness and education with special guest, Dr. Billy Hensley, President and CEO of the National Endowment for Financial Education. So, Billy, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's just great to see you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. So, we had a a conversation uh, a couple of days ago on Tuesday with three leaders who uh, explored the meaning of financial wellness. And if you take a look at NEFE, you've been around for four decades, you provided financial education and you're evolving into a champion of financial education by providing leadership research and collaborations to advance financial well-being. So talk a little bit about that journey. Talk about your history and where you are now in your arc. And then we'll let, let's talk about some of your programs. Sure. Well, when, when you think about the professionalization of the financial planning industry, we were part of the beginning of that. Um, back before NEFI existed, um, we started, and I say we because we're an offshoot of the College for Financial Planning. And the College for Financial Planning created um, the designation Certified Financial Planner. The goal was to professionalize uh, the practice and uh, role of financial planners in the financial planning industry. And for many years, a couple of decades, uh, the college grew, uh, formalized the education. You know, back then it was uh, pre-internet. So you would do, you would come in and you would do residency components. Uh, some of your listeners may remember those days. You would mail in your, your assignments, um, and then you would have residency components. And in the 80s, they the leadership at the time felt that they should give back. They should do something to help young people uh, understand financial planning, understand personal finance management. And they created the high school financial planning program as a component of an outreach program by the College for Financial Planning. And that was very successful. They launched it in Denver, uh, and then it went national the following year uh, from 84 uh, up to 85, then it went national. And then 1992, the leadership and the board of the college decided to uh, create the National Endowment for Financial Education to become the parent organization, the umbrella organization of the college. They were expanding their offerings into graduate programming. Uh, I think on some levels, they wanted to professionalize the charitable nature of the work, oversee the endowment of the college. So this is this is a school that is not necessarily focused on people who have um, infinite means, right? You're talking about uh, democratizing this idea of financial planning and bringing right. it everybody, bringing it to people who perhaps already uh, have professionals that they're employing or uh, that they contract with, but then to people who um, are not necessarily um, in that, that personal position, maybe have uh, skills that they could share with other people, but also can take advantage of these uh, of this knowledge if they could only learn it and you were providing that service. Right. We, we, you know, the, the college worked to create, um, you know, hundreds and thousands of fi uh, professional certified financial planners so that the bar, the minimum standard was a high bar to help as many people and clients as they could reach. Um, and there's great value in that. And, and um, so, you know, NEFI became and in, came into being because of that. And in, in 97, 1997, they made the decision to sell sell the college, and um, uh, they used what was in the endowment already. They used the proceeds from the sale of that, the intellectual property, and so forth. Um, and then <clears throat> the following year, they sold the campus. The, they had built a new campus for the college in the late eighties, <clears throat> and um, uh, then the NEFI became a separate charity organization. Um, and we did many years of, of partnership work. We, we funded grants. Um, and so we became uh, at first a grant making foundation, but evolved into an operating foundation, which means we execute our own charitable work. We don't just sort of write checks to others to do that. And, um, uh, you know, the 
so about half of our history was as a as a higher education institution. And uh, we've been NEFI for 30 years and 25, well, I guess 26 years now as a separate uh, uh, foundation. And we we saw the need for um, you talk about democratizing financial planning. We wanted to democratize financial information and financial education. So we took it a step further and we started growing our programming work. We created a college program. Um, we created uh, something called Smart About Money, which was uh, meant to reach working adults. Uh, at, at our peak, in terms of sort of outreach, we were uh, direct consumer, and then we were reached out to intermediaries like teachers, like college administrators, those who would use our materials. We worked with uh, national partners um, like Habitat for Humanity and Dress for Success and Catholic Charities and um, the Boy Scouts and helped them create materials uh, outreach items, lessons, programming for their clients, for their constituents. Uh, we did uh, lots of work on awareness. Uh, we started doing national polling. Uh, we started thinking about our grant making in a terms of uh, uh, making these smaller dollar programmatic grants to fewer but higher dollar research grants. We felt that we needed to elevate um, our influence. So we went to a higher level in terms of what we were trying to achieve and that, you know, data, information, research projects, because we felt that that would inform practice more directly than, you know, one or two programs at a time. So um, now are you, yeah. Have you given up on your direct to uh, end user kind of services? And are you now working exclusively with partners and conducting research? Yeah, that's where we are now. Um, in uh, 2018, we made the decision to end all of our direct consumer uh, websites because we've prided ourselves as an organization on being what we say first in. You know, we we were doing direct free uh, consumer education, and and you know we would go to like financial blogger conferences back when it would be a couple of hundred people, um, and now there are thousands of those uh, writers and, and bloggers. And same with programming. Same with high school financial education, same with colleges, more and more people are creating resources that are doing this work. And we felt that we wanted to get um, go to the next thing that was truly needed. And it was it was more information, more data. And so we we ended all of our direct to consumer initiatives in 18 in 2020. We ended all of all of our uh, consumer education program uh, through schools. Uh, we either spun it off to another organization or we retired the work. Because we felt that um, those aspects were well served now. You know, we we were one of the first, if not the first in most of those. In, and now there's many people uh, and organizations who do that well. And so we're at the next phase of this. Direct services and knowledge so that people can support themselves. This idea is is very strongly disseminated throughout the direct services community today. So it's mm -hmm. now no longer seen as we will provide you with a meal today or housing today, and somebody else will provide you with financial training. Mm -hmm. Now it's all done out of one hand. And you're absolutely right. The people with those kinds of, of direct contacts on a local basis are better positioned uh, than, mm -hmm. than you would be because they have the local knowledge, they have the local trust. Right. That's exactly right. And um, I, I don't like the savior mentality anyway. You know, I grew up in central Appalachia and that sense of so, someone else coming in to swoop right. in and save the day. I like the idea of helping, you know, build capacity or helping better understand how uh, a problem or why a problem exists and what are the components needed to do that. And so we've elevated our work to think about this from the ecosystem level, meaning what influences the personal finance ecosystem? What are the, all the components? And when you think about our arc as a community of financial educators in particular, and then a further extension of those who are working in financial wealth, you know, we started 
thinking about, you, you made the point very astutely about uh, standardizing and democratizing a profession and then getting that information to folks, you know, democratizing personal finance information. And then, you know, for a while we were in this place of financial education equals sort of improved financial health. Well, it contributes to that. And then financial education needed better quality. You know, we needed to do a better job of, of teaching uh, the topic. And then we started looking at who had access to quality fin ed. And that's a very um, uneven experience, especially in schools. And then we started looking at how do you make financial education more relevant and relatable? Um, and now and now we're looking at that financial education helps you navigate an economic system that is sort of unfair and uneven um, and uh, fraught with issues, uh, historic systemic issues. So we're not saying financial education solves that problem per se, but we are saying it's a it's an important component of that. And so we're looking at at the at financial education and financial well-being from a systemic level. And that's why research data advocacy, uh, think tanks, bringing people together is essential so that we can see how that we can do FinEd well and then work together with those who are doing other elements of the personal finance ecosystem instead of just saying our one solution or our one tactic solves the problem uh, or creates financial health in a vacuum. And we, you know, we've evolved past that thinking as, as an organization and hopefully as a community. Is your predicate that, and I, I hearken back to your comment that you come from Appala Appalachia. Mm -hmm. Is your predicate that the lack of, of financial uh, education and knowledge creates a systemic inequity that until that is balanced within different communities, communities um, that might be outside of cities in rural areas, communities of color, uh, communities of new immigrants, um, people who have less than a college education, until that is addressed, you really don't have a society where merit can, um, can gain purchase. Because if you don't have the ability to manage your finances, then no matter how meritorious you are, no matter how hard a worker you are, no matter how good a thinker you are, you, you, you operate out of, a, out of a level of disadvantage. Is that yeah. part of what you're what you're thinking, uh, Billy? That's a component of it. Um, that where we are now is that yes to what you just said, but um, you can know all of the answers to the personal finance quiz. Okay, you can become an expert in the topic, but if you do not have opportunity, if you do not have economic mobility. If you are underpaid because of your skin color or your gender or your education level, um, if you are in a place that's uh, a literal place, as in geography, where there are uh, very few opportunities to have uh, regulated financial services, for example, uh, when you when you add that to the fact that you are also not given access to quality financial education. We think that all of these components are essential to create financial wealth. Mm -hmm. And so depending on how weak or strong one of those elements of your financial ecosystem is, um, if you make a lot of money, then you may not need to, you know, you may not know the answer, but you always have a strong paycheck coming in. And then the other extreme of that is like maybe you were provided quality excellent financial education, but there's very little economic mobility in your community. And so we're saying that no single piece of this will solve the problem alone. And that's actually, a, you know, it makes sense when you hear us talk about it, but that is a fairly new concept in our community. That's, that's, that's so very interesting. So you're, you're creating this, this, your, your opponent, your, you view yourself as a component of a right. very sophisticated um, set of factors, right? And you want to add an ingredient, but that ingredient by itself is not the the savior ingredient. You said you don't like being viewed as a savior, right? What you're what you're doing is you're making a contribution. So you have to have awareness of what is going around around you mm -hmm. in order to function in concert with partners to make that 
ingredient gain purchase. So let's talk a little bit about your initiatives and sure. some of the research. Um, so could you just sort of lay out your research and your initiatives, and then let's delve into some of the factors that you've uncovered that would be surprising to us and, and would allow us to, to um, understand how we can function in this world to help uh, you do your work. Sure. Well, we uh, uh, research is uh, multi-tiered at, at BV. And uh, so we do very traditional or we fund, I should say, very traditional research, academic research that, you, you know, the multiple years, you know, grants where you're where someone proposes uh, a complex issue that they would like to Give me an uh, investigate. Yeah. Give me an example. And um, so one one example of uh, a research project that uh, is underway right now is with the Urban Institute. And they're looking at the how does uh, reporting rent payment on a credit report change a person's uh, financial credit profile? Um, yes. So if I have, if I if I'm paying rent and I'm making my rent payments all the time, that's one thing. And then let's say I have a problem and I I I, I become late on my rent. It's going to hit my credit report. You're looking to see whether th this study is looking to see whether that has a disproportionate negative or positive impact um, on on credit. Is that what you're what you're looking at? Well, that could potentially be one of the outcomes. But the reason we went into this is because very few people who are paying rent have a credit presence. Mm -hmm. um, and those tend to be predominantly lower income and or people of color. And so if you're not present, if you don't have a credit profile, how could you do these next steps that are seen as what you should or shouldn't you know, do next financially, buy a house and, and, and buy a car and things like that uh, until you are present or have a credit profile, how could you uh, be seen as credit worthy, even though uh, people have been doing things like paying rent and paying utility bills for many years? It's not about paying on time or not. It's about creating and what does your presence and creation of credit profile actually do? Uh, does it give you enough or proper agency to, to be able to have uh, the ability to make more financial decisions that you would have been closed out of before. So that's an example uh, of that. We, we're doing other projects on um, understanding our, our current measures of financial literacy. So it's, you know, a scale that shows, are you financially literate or not? That phrasing is, you know, some people like it, some people don't, but it's, you know, it's what we have at the moment. Uh, but we're looking at, have those been vetted to account for multiple experiences of of cultural capital and 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 uh, experience and representation, um, and so those are sort of those long term academic uh, research projects. Um, we're looking at uh, family socialization. Uh, how does uh, being socialized into discussions about money um, influence your, you know, your confidence and so forth in making financial decisions? We also do lots of consumer polling. So opinion polling, national polling on topics. Uh, an example of one that got a lot of attention last spring during April, which is Financial Capability Month. Um, as we surveyed uh, Americans on this topic, you know, do you think every young person in high school should be uh, required to take a class in financial education to graduate. 88% said yes. And 80% of that same sample said they wish they had taken that class themselves. And so that those are examples of sort of quicker turnaround real time to look at sort of, you know, the, the components of this. We, we, we use the research to help advocate for classes, teacher professional development, you know, investing, excuse me, investing in this topic uh, so that every student, no matter their zip code, has the same access to quality fin ed. Well, let me ask you the fina a financial question. Sometimes studies are executed um, and they make a point, which is really about spending more money on a particular program. But they're not making the point 
about reallocating resources that we have from a particular program to other programs. They're not really living within their budgetary means. They basically, these studies always end up with somebody needs to spend more here. Hmm. When you look at the, from, from your perspective, in terms of your own financial um, uh, responsibility, how do you um, transform your research into recommendations or do you? Do you just put out the data and you allow other people to use it? Or do you also suggest certain um, changes in how America uses our money to strengthen ourselves? Yeah, um, I would I would say that our research agenda uh, for many years probably was here's the information. Um, here's what we know or don't know about particular groups. Um, you, you know, as you age or depending on your, 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 your generational profile, um, we're, we're now looking at, are those measures actually capturing what they say they do? You know, you, you can do a survey and think you're kind of attaining a certain level of information and we're, we're stress testing that, um, at the moment. And so, I'm getting to to what you asked because I, I needed I need to lay a little bit of this sort of groundwork in terms of uh, we're in a in a space of transitioning that thinking about the research we're we're looking at it to say for example we think that every person in high school in this country should be guaranteed a high school financial education course of at least a semester. Uh, we don't just say do it. You know, we also understand that there's only so many hours in the day and there's all kinds of in- topics that are deemed important by school districts and principals and parents alike. Uh, but what we say is that here are states that did it. Here are ways that states have done it. Um, you know, some states have 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 sp- spun out or ended uh, requirements that are redundant or maybe are no longer relevant to a current modern workforce. Um, and so that that's what we do is we provide examples of what to do uh, when in terms of advocacy, there's no such thing as perfect policy. And so that's why we look at, you know, at, at what other states have done at the state level. Um because research is as only as strong as the questions you ask and the tools you have. And so we're in a place now that we're not just asking questions. We're actually stress testing the tools of measurement. And what does it tell? You know, what are we learning? Uh, about? Well, one of the big issues is that we don't have a sufficiently robust math regimen in high schools, because if you if you don't have the math, you can't do the financial literacy. Right. I mean, there. Um, I remember uh, when I went to high school, we had a financial literacy um, course and three quarters of the people really had a very difficult time because the fundamental math wasn't there. And you could tell mm-hmm. the people who found the, the course to be fairly straightforward were the people who had the vocabulary. So you've got a you've got a pretty uh, fundamental uh, set of challenges here. How do you. Um, change that without get going down a rabbit hole of education policy, public school mm-hmm. vouchers versus private school and all this other stuff. How do you mm-hmm. end up being able to do research that results in actual action rather than terminable debate and argument? Well, um, you know, we that's one of the reasons we focus on giving examples of where it's worked. Instead of just saying, here's a finding, you know, 88 percent of your constituents want this. And then here are the outcomes. You know, the, 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 the outcomes data on financial education in schools is very clear. You know, the credit scores are over 20 points higher than a state that doesn't require it. Revolving debt is lower. Uh, you borrow better for college. Um, you have uh, fewer delinquencies there. Everything points to a very clear, um, uh, a stronger place to start financially. And it would seem that you should be able to finesse the uh, Democratic Republican Party nonsense because really mm -hmm. everybody wants people to be self-sufficient. And it doesn't matter if you're the most 
liberal or progressive, but progressives are the most conservatives of conservatives, right? Who's going to be against self-sufficiency right. in this country, right? Right. And that's, you know, that's the point we make with this is that it's a bipartisan issue. Uh, There should not be politics. Occasionally it becomes political. Um, We've seen this in a few states where it's not a bipartisan support. But by and large, the 15 states that now have a a one semester requirement uh, to graduate, um, almost all of them passed it with a near unanimous yay in the House side and the Senate side of state legislatures. We've seen it become political when maybe a particular something else was tied to it or what what they were proposing to eliminate. Maybe people didn't like or maybe they just didn't like, you know, it, it was just the state of the political affairs in that particular state. But when you have states like Florida and Georgia and Michigan passing uh, this based on the research, based on the data, based on the outcomes at a near unanimous rate, it shows you that there is there is will for this. Uh, and there are lots of smart people at every state Department of Education who can figure out how to execute it. Um, but what state legislatures and advocates need to understand is that it's not just add it. It's it's to add it well, meaning right. you don't just say do it. You, you, you have to add all of these essential components to make it effective. And are that's where finding, we want to give examples. Are you finding that um, students um, absorb this information better when it goes from being less theoretical to being more practical, where you take out a wallet and you basically say, OK, let's look at what we have here and what you want to buy and what you might want to buy in the future. How do you plan? You know, those kinds of examples, which are real present there today, as opposed to talking, talking about sort of theoretical models. Are you going into that type of research? What type of education works best? Or are you mostly focused on the policy prescriptions at a much more higher, high level at a, at a 30,000 foot level? Well, I mean, that's where I, um, that's what I was meaning when I was saying that we're at a place now that that we believe that financial education does not solve the problem of um, uh, poverty, doesn't solve the problem of financial inequities, but it does help you navigate that economic system that is unjust and unfair. And so we feel that if financial education is truly effective. It's not only it not only has to be relevant and timely to your point. It also has to recognize and have a discussion about the history of inequity, economic inequity in particular, uh, meaning um, I'll use where I grew up as an example. You know, we, we mentioned that for a moment for generations. You know, uh, being able to own a home is one of the ways that helps people advance uh, economically um, and grow, you know, the value of that growing. And and for generations uh, in certain parts of Appalachia, where I'm from, uh, companies owned every right. piece of the, the economic system. There were company towns. You could not own homes. Towns. Right. You could not own a home. You could not purchase anything in that town. Right. Without using the script, meaning it wasn't even money. Right. It was just tokens, basically, from the company. And so for generations, my ancestors could not own property in a way that helped them build wealth. They were and those that did own land, they were land rich and resource poor. Right. Uh, and if you sold your land, you sold it for 10 or 12 rifles and half a dozen pigs if you were lucky. And then the company took billions of dollars literal billions and billions of dollars from that land and and the owner or the 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 people who settled that region had no part of that economic mobility right and so we see that same thing in a much worse uh, uh examples happening in communities of color uh the economic system that's built on white supremacy for example in some in, in many ways truly um has You know, we feel that financial education, if we have those discussions about you're not as bad at money necessarily as you think, uh, there's a lot of things stacked against you. Not only are there multiple hundreds of companies a day trying to get your money and get in front of you and billboards and and, and marketing and, 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 and whether they're 
whether they're honest or dishonest practices, there's so many people trying to get your money on and layer into that um, the racism that's there, the homophobia that's there, um, uh, the unfair practices. You know, some people say there's too much regulation. Some people say there's not enough regulation. Some people say we need to be able to use education as a tool to just teach people and then let them decide. But if the system isn't designed in a way that's equitable and fair, financial education can't do very much. And so what we're saying is that that part of that conversation about financial education to make it effective and relevant to your points is that we also have to understand how certain regions, communities, races, uh, genders, and so forth have been treated in the past and why uh, the wealth and equities are so vast. But I take I take another lesson from what you're what you're saying. Um, these problems do coexist. And each of those problems, because they're so big, they're so complicated, each of them can't be um, addressed as a whole. It's it's like trying to uh, to eat uh, a um, a uh, a whole uh, week's worth of food within one sitting and so that you, you can save time uh, for the rest of the week. Right. You can't do it. Right. Um, what what I take from from what you're saying, Billy, is that um, what we can do is learn lessons today that will allow us to have more power mm-hmm. to address these other issues. Right. And you sort of you sort of choose your issues. If you're in Appalachia, you'll have a particular set of issues. If you have a family history, you have a particular circumstance. If you're in inner city Chicago, you might have a different set of issues associated, but different on the ground, right? If you are an immigrant coming in and you don't have any capital whatsoever and you don't have family connections, uh, but there might be a community around you, you have different issues. Each of those issues, if you take the subset of learnings about finances and apply them in that environment, and you have policymakers who are paying attention to their constituents in DC, you might be able to create a little bit more room and a little bit more power to create self-sufficiency, which is in everybody's in this country's um, uh, um, uh, interest. So right. as, as we wrap up here, talk about what kind of impact you want to have in the next five years. How do you want the National Endowment for Financial Education how do you? How does your board want the National Endowment for Financial Education? Um, how do, how do they want this organization to be known? Mm. And in five years, if you're looking back uh, to today and you're saying, "Wow, we had a we had a great impact over these last five years," what will that look like? Mm. Well, you know, our mission says that we champion effective financial education. Our job is to do as much as we can to understand how to make it as effective as possible. And one of those, one of the ways that we're looking at that now is giving more voice, uh, listening more, understanding what works and what doesn't in different communities. Um, So in five years, I want that. I, I would like that an essential component of every financial education class in this country is a discussion of economic oppression. And what does that mean? at your household table when you're balancing your checkbook or when you're looking at your at your financial life and your financial goals. And it's about understanding the system that's there and improving the system. But in the meantime, we have to live in it. And so learning as much as we can. And what does having agency and information do for us? Knowledge, what does that do for us in the system that exists while championing uh, a change uh, to that system that 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 creates more opportunity for economic mobility. Uh, And I think that means better measures of what we do and how we do our work effectively. I think that means more access. In five years, I would like to see uh, every student in every high school have a full semester class in financial education and what, what that financial education looks like are points you've made that it's timely, it's relevant, it's relatable, it's taught by a well-trained educator. And we are having these discussions about uh, economic inequality in this country and how does financial education contribute to the improvement of that. 
So in many respects, you're hearkening back to Emerson's essay on self-reliance, right? In other words, part of what you're doing is not just doing a top-down, educating people who are less educated in finances. Now you're talking about how do you connect the dots between all these different factors, including financial education, so that people become more self-reliant and more empowered, that they get to craft their own future by not only a change in skills, but also a change in mindset. Is that part of what you're what you're looking for? Right. I, I don't know the essay that you're talking about, but I, I think our our example of this is 10, 15 years ago, most of the people in our community, meaning financial education community, drew a pretty straight line between financial education and financial well-being, that one equated the other. And what we're saying is that 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 straight line may work for very few people. Uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just you have to understand that the line has to wrap around all these boulders in the way and you have to kind of see it that way, that it's an important piece of this and that any single solution doesn't solve the problem. And, and what I've said for years is that if a school's math scores are low, we don't stop teaching math. We look at multiple ways to improve math instruction, math outcomes, engagement with the topic, textbooks, what students know when they get to my classroom. All of that has to be considered. And that's from a, an evaluation mindset in my mind. It's, it's about improvement. It's not about proving. It's about improving. And if we continue to try to improve uh, the state of financial education within the economic um, ecosystem, then I will be very happy with that. And I, I don't know if that's exactly what was the point was being made in that essay, but uh, that's how I see it. And I would love to read the essay. So if you don't mind sharing it sometime, I would <laughs> love to read. I send it to you. you, you Thank you. Like it. Dr. Yes. Billy Hensley, President and CEO of the National Endowment for Financial Education. Thank you so much for your insights. And thank you for sharing the work of, of your staff, your board, uh, your partners and and uh, your funders. It's just it's just so wonderful to have you on. Thank you very much.